see my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and left up and the early exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was not so disfigured behind that of any <coughs> human being, and his form moored behind human likeness. So he will sprinkle many notions, and kings will shut their mouth because of him. For what they were not told, they wells and <clears throat> what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And who has, the, who has the arm of the Lord behind reveal? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root of, our <clears throat> of dry ground. He had no beauty of, or majesty to attract us to him. Not in his appearance, that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected from you <coughs> mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from Unipol had their face. He was despised and we held him in loosening. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we consider him punished by God, striking by him, and afflicted by the worst spirit for our transaction. He was crushed for our iniquity. The pain, the, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. <clears throat> he all like sheep. If gone astray, he has turn, turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid in him the iniquity of us all. <clears throat> he, was oppressed, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as the sheep before his shirt is silence. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and ju judgment he was taken away. Yet who of, <coughs> who of generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the, the living. For the transgression of my people he was, he was punished. He was assigned a, a grave with the weak and the, with the rich he, in his dead. To, the, to he had done no violence, nor was any desisting in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and, and cause him to suffer, and to the Lord make his, his life and offer him for sin. He will see his offspring and prolong his day, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of the life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquity. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and uh, he will divide the spoil with, <coughs> with the strong because he poured our out his life unto death, and there was number of him the transgression for the birth, the son of man, and made the intersection for the transgression. Do you have that passage in front of you? If you've got your Bibles, please um, keep it open on page 741. Apologies to anyone uh, here who isn't a tennis fan, <coughs> but uh, you may have missed it, but last week someone called Emma Raducanu, an 18-year-old British woman, did the most amazing thing. <coughs> I just want to relive it for a second. She won the biggest uh, US, she won the biggest tennis tournament that there is in the globe, which is the US Tennis Open, and it's, it's more than 40 years since a British woman did that. 
So that would be a pretty amazing achievement in itself, but even more amazing, so she's done it at the age of 18. She just took her A-levels a few, a few months ago. But perhaps even more amazing than that, she's not even an established champion. So actually she had to qualify for her own place in that tournament. She wasn't given one uh, as the great champions or the established champions are. I saw an article this week that she's still kind of getting over what's happened and can't believe when she sees uh, footage of herself playing in the final that it was actually her playing. So life is full of uh, amazing achievements, isn't it? It's full of people doing astonishing things. What an amazing thing to have done uh, at the age of 18. In this passage of the Bible, we're, taught, we're told about an act or an achievement um, that is so great uh, that everything else pales into insignificance compared, uh, compared to it. You can see that in uh, verse 13 of chapter 52, where God himself is speaking, uh, and he says to those who are listening, see, my servant will act wisely. So this uh, poem, uh, this poem spoken by God and spoken by the prophet uh, Isaiah, um, kind of falls into five sections, those five slides that Giuseppe read out for us. So, Here's the summary of the first three verses, verses 13 to 15. Uh, and uh, in a way, this first uh, three verses, the first of the five sections of the poem, sets the scene for us. It tells us what this is all about. And here's my summary of it. See the greatest act in history, in the appalling and amazing death of the Lord's servant. So here is God speaking to us, see my servant will act wisely. Uh, and we've already heard him in this section of Isaiah speaking about a servant. We're told that he's talking to us about a person through whom he will achieve his purpose to bring salvation to his world. Uh, and he tells us in this verse 13 that this servant is going to be a truly great person. What they're going to do is going to be a phenomenal achievement. He'll be raised and lifted up and highly exalted, verse 13 tells us. And actually, hearing these words two and a half thousand years off, they were written. We can see, can't we, that Christianity truly is a global phenomenon. It's hard to put a number exactly on it, isn't it? But if you look at statistics, you'll see that well over a billion people across the globe uh, own or profess the name of Jesus Christ, uh, even though perhaps they don't fully understand what that means, there'll be varying degrees to, what, to, to which people understand what that means. But it's true that these words in uh, verse 13 about the servant being raised and lifted up and highly exalted have come true. We can see it in our own experience. And the Lord goes on to tell us in this opening section that this truly great thing that his servant's going to do is going to be centred particularly around his death. You see that in verse 14, just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. We learn in these verses, don't we, that the death of the servant is, is the event that's being talked about. And it's an appalling death. And we're going to think a bit more about that as the poem goes on. We also see from these verses that it's a death that divides opinion as well. It's an appalling death. And we see in verse 14 that many are appalled by it. For, so, for many people around the world today, when they hear about, about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, they can't really get beyond the fact that he died in a gruesome way on a cross uh, 2,000 years ago outside Jerusalem. It just seems an appalling event that they don't really want to think about very much uh, further. But these verses go on to say, don't they, in verse 15, that also some people, many people, will see that the death of the servant is an amazing event. See in verse 15, that kings will shut their mouths because of him. That's an image of them being speechless with amazement. They see what an astonishing thing that Jesus has done in his death. And they're just, there's nothing that they can say. They're so amazed by it. I really quite like this image. I don't know about you. If 
of rulers being speechless with amazement, of shutting their mouths. Rulers and kings aren't the kind of people that you tend to think of, are they, as being speechless. They're normally people that have got a lot to say to us about the way that things are. And yet what the servant will do, we're told in these verses, is so phenomenal that actually they will be speechless. They've come to realise about how significant and how amazing the achievement of God's servant is. Our own queen is an example of that. She seems to have a personal allegiance to Jesus, doesn't she? She always mentions him in her yearly Christmas message. Uh, Someone who has still a degree of power and respect, and yet she gives her allegiance and her respect to Jesus because of what he's done. And around the world and across the generations, the cross has always been the symbol of Christianity, the global symbol. And that is because of what, the, that is what these verses are, are predicting would happen. Because of this servant, and in particular because of his death, as people come to see what an amazing and important event it is. So there we go, that sets the scene for us. Uh, here is the Lord speaking to us directly about his servant, and in particular about his death. And the death which to some people just seems an appalling and horrifying way to die. But for those who really understand its true meaning, is an amazing thing. So amazing that even rulers uh, are speechless with amazement. But the poem goes on to acknowledge that that is quite a strange and unexpected thing to be talking about. I mean, after all, when I was talking about uh, an amazing event, I chose Emma Raducani. That was quite amazing, isn't it? We wouldn't perhaps necessarily be expect to be thinking about someone dying uh, as an amazing event. And the poem goes on to acknowledge that as we hear the voice of Isaiah the prophet himself speaking in this second section, the second, three verse, uh, second uh, section, verses 1 to 3 of chapter 53. And we see, don't we, he says, Isaiah says in uh, 53 verse 1, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. The arm of the Lord just means God acting in power. Who would have thought that God's acting in power to save his people would have been in this way? I suppose we're, we're kind of used to, aren't we, perhaps stories of great heroism, maybe stories from Afghanistan of people giving their lives for others. And those are, are wonderful stories, aren't they? But this true story about the servant giving his life is something even more unexpected than those acts of heroism that we read about in wartime. And we'll see that it's even greater, much, much greater, than even the greatest act of heroism of someone giving their life. But these verses go on to just dwell on the fact that it was so unexpected. The prophet says he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. It just conjures up the garden as you come in to church, the garden that Ruth and, and Shirley work on. You see the, f- the lovely flowers, but you don't even notice that the green shoots that are growing up, do you? Because they're just insignificant, they're not very important. And yet, this verse tells us, like a root out of dry ground. For those with eyes to see, the way that Jesus grew up actually did fulfill a, a wonderful promise, or many promises that God had been making through history uh, about a root that would grow in the royal house of David. But on the surface, as Jesus grew up, there was nothing particularly special about him. We see from these verses, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Jesus grew up in Nazareth, which was a bit of a backwater in Israel. It was certainly not Jerusalem, the capital. Um, It wasn't a London with its hustle and bustle. It was not a very uh, interesting place in many ways. Jesus was certainly nothing to look at, particularly from his uh, physical appearance. And more than that, verse 3, we read that he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. You see, as you read about Jesus' public ministry in the Gospels, on the face of it, it wasn't particularly successful. For example, in John 6, we're told about how many people in the crowds that followed Jesus turned away from him. 
when he made it clear to them that actually the kingdom that he was bringing in was not about seeking political power at the time, uh, but about a deeper salvation. Uh, in Matthew uh, chapter 11, we're told that John the Baptist, who was a special prophet that God had raised up to tell people about Jesus coming to earth, even John the Baptist had a moment of disappointment with Jesus, really questioning whether he was indeed the Messiah, uh, that he'd been telling everyone that he was. As John seemed to be impatient that Jesus wasn't getting on with the job of exercising judgment in the nation of Israel. And in fact, in John's Gospel as well, we realise that at, various point, at a point in his ministry, Jesus' ministry seemed to be going so badly that his brothers, who didn't believe in him, thought that they would give him a bit of campaign advice about how to improve his PR. Just go to Jerusalem, they said, uh, if you want to be known. He didn't seem to be a particularly successful speaker or campaigner in many ways. These verses are true of Jesus. He was one from, from whom people hid their faces. He was despised. And we held him in low esteem. Not a celebrity of the time. Yet the third part of this poem in verses 4 to 6 bring us to the heart of all that Jesus achieved and why it is so great. And just to summarise that, what he achieved is that he died the death that we deserve. Verse 4, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we were healed. As Jesus died on the cross, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as he did that, as he was truly abandoned by his father, that's all that we in the generation at the time could see of his death. We considered him punished by God uh, and afflicted, verse 4 tells us. The religious leaders at the time as he hung on the cross said, he trusted in God. Let God deliver him, if he delights in him. And of course, God didn't at that time deliver him from being forsaken by him. But these verses show us that actually as Jesus died, suffering a fate more awful than any of us, in fact, will suffer, uh, those who trust in him. Not just the physical agony of death, but the much deeper agony of being punished uh, and forsaken by God the Father. What was going on in reality was the greatest act of heroism you could ever imagine. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. This just means the wrong things that we've done. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And verse 6 tells us why that is. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, the thing is, we've all been like these sheep, going astray from God, our shepherd, aren't we? We are people who've lied. We're people who have taken advantage of each other sexually. We're people who have been greedy and envious. We've been selfish and proud. And these verses tell us, and verse 6 tells us, that all those attitudes stem from us going astray from God and following our own way rather than following him. We all know, don't we, that there's something wrong out there with the world. You only have to turn on the news uh, every day to see the evil and violence uh, that surround in our world, but also we see it much closer to home, don't we? And equally, we know that there's something wrong with our world and its relationship with God uh, as we ourselves suffer pain and hardship and ultimately we suffer death. What was most appalling about Jesus' death was not the physical agony he suffered. All the humiliation that he suffered from those around him, terrible as they were, 
as some people experience those in, our, in their deaths today, don't they? But what was most terrible about what Jesus suffered was being forsaken by God, punished by him, feeling the full force of his justified hostility. And can I ask us this morning, can we see, as we see Jesus dying on the cross in that way, can we see that that's what we deserve to suffer? That's the big question that we're asked by this passage and that God invites us to see. And we see that we deserved to be punished by God in that way. Because if we can see this, can we see too that he was pierced for our transgressions? He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. In other words, if we can see that that was the punishment that we deserved to die, then by God's grace, we can also see that there he was taking it in our place. And so what he's achieved for us is peace. Peace with God. Peace with our creator. Forgiveness for all the things that we've done. Whatever, whatever we've done, however bad it is. Past, present and future. And not just forgiveness with God, not just peace with God, but also this promise in Verse 5, that by his wounds we are healed. You see, healing, sickness uh, and suffering uh, came into the world because of God's curse on sin. And actually what Isaiah is showing us is that as God takes the punishment for our sin, that God lifts his curse. That curse has been broken as it falls on Jesus Christ. One day, for those who can see what is going on here, and have put their trust in Jesus, all our suffering and all the wounds and struggles and difficulties that we have in life as a result of living in a broken world under God's curse, all of those will be fully and finally healed and taken away and be no more. This is truly a wonderful, wonderful thing, isn't it? As we think about this really sobering news uh, about how terrible our sin is, and yet how wonderful Jesus is, who has taken the punishment for it on himself. But how can all this be? It seems such a strange and such an awesome thing to think about. In the fourth part of the poem, Isaiah goes on to show us that Jesus became just like one of us. He was just like one of us. He was able to stand in for us in this way because he was one of us yet without sin. Verse 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Jesus was certainly oppressed, wasn't he? If you think, if you read about the gospel accounts and you think about the way that he was treated, particularly by the authorities at the time. Uh, Very early on in his ministry, he was denounced uh, as being a harmful person. In fact, satanic The people whose job it was to tell the truth of God to the nation of Israel denounced Jesus as coming from Satan. They plotted to kill him from very early on. In John 9, we're told that Jesus' followers were ostracized socially. If you believed Jesus was the Messiah, you would be put out of the synagogue. But Jesus was also afflicted. Uh, He shared in all the sufferings that we suffer living in a broken world under God's curse. He suffered all the things that we suffer. We're told that he got hungry in Mark 2. He got thirsty, uh, John 4. Mark 6, he got tired. John 11, Jesus knew what it was to weep as he was bereaved at the graveside of a friend. Jesus knew what it was to have the affliction of a frustrating day at work. But here's the difference between him and us. He did not open his mouth. Jesus endured that affliction, uh, trusting himself to God willingly, not taking vengeance into his own hands. Even though in verse 7 we're told that he was, as he's led away to his death uh, by the authorities at the time, he did not open his mouth. 
he wouldn't take revenge uh, against those who did him wrong. Verse 8, by oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was afflicted. You see, as he went to his death, he stood alone. Who of his generation protested? We read that his closest, one of his closest friends betrayed him to his executioners. Uh, and the rest of his friends, the rest of his closest friends, uh, abandoned him and run off, ran off. He stood alone when it came to the moment of his death. And he was treated like us in every way. Verse 9, he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence. He was assigned a grave with us, just as if he was another one of us, another sinner, or another rich person, or whatever it was. He was just like one of us in his death. And yet, verse 9 tells us that there is this crucial difference, isn't there, between him and us. He had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Jesus was never self-righteous in his attitude towards sinners. Look at the way that he welcomed them in the Gospels. Jesus always cared about the poor and the vulnerable in his society, people who had no status, people who were broken, he welcomed. And there was no deceit in his mouth. Jesus always spoke the truth to people, even though it brought him into conflict with very powerful people. And yet he always did it gently, didn't he? Think about how he spoke to Simon when he was rebuking him about his attitude towards a sinful woman. Jesus became like one of us in every way, yet with one crucial difference, he never sinned. He was never anxious about the future, never failed to trust God, his Father. And so because he came like one of us in every way, he was able to do what we've heard about in the centre of this poem. He was able to be the perfect substitute who could die on the cross, taking the punishment of God in our place to make us whole. And so as we think about the last poem of the poem, God tells us that now he's exalted, the saviour of his people. Verse 10, all this suffering, God te- uh, the, the prophet tells us, was all God's plan. It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though, as we've been thinking about, the Lord makes his offering for sin, uh, it was always God's plan to raise him from the dead so that he would see his offspring. He would see people like you, people like me, if we've turned to him and recognised what he's done for us. Recognise that the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. This is what Jesus has achieved. Verse 11, he's seen the light of life and he's satisfied. And by his knowledge... The righteous one has justified many and will bear their iniquities. And the same is true for us today. This is true for us today. If we can see what Jesus has done in his death for us, if we can see that he died the death that we deserve, and if we'll put our trust in him, then we can be one of these people in verse 12. The great and strong, the the many thousands, millions of people across the globe and through the generations uh, who have come to realise what he's done for them and have put their trust in him and can see that what he's achieved for them is an eternal peace uh, and healing uh, and hope. There's this lovely bit in this last verse, isn't there, about Jesus' priestly role for those that he has saved. He was numbered with the transgressors. In other words, he became exactly like one of us. He's borne the sin of many. He's borne our sins if we put our trust in him. And even now, he's making intercession for us, for the transgressors. If you've put your trust in Jesus today, he is at the Father's right hand, praying to God, asking God to complete the work that he's begun in you, to complete that salvation and bring you to his new creation. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? 
of all that he has and continues to do for us. So then, just to kind of wrap up and to consider what we should take away from this wonderful, this really amazing passage of Scripture, and how it just fits into what we've been hearing in these passages in Isaiah about these messages of hope written so many, thousands, so many hundreds of years ago. We heard last week from Ollie, didn't we, that Isaiah telling us to, to wake up and then to speak up and to, to clean up in light of the good news. This whole section of Isaiah has been about these wonderful messages of hope, about a great salvation that God would bring, not just to his people, but to people across the world. And what this chapter adds to that is it shows us so clearly, and perhaps in the clearest way so far in this section of Isaiah, about what the good news is. What is the hope that Christians have? What is the message that we have to share? What is the message that we need to wake up to? And the message that we need to clean up in light of? You see, at that time, God's people were in slavery, in oppression, uh, in the Babylonian Empire. Perhaps what they most longed for was to be back in their own land, in Israel. They longed for uh, a political liberation, to be free from the tyranny uh, and oppression of their Babylonian captors. But this chapter shows us so clearly, doesn't it, that actually what the salvation that God was promising them was not primarily a political liberation. It's not primarily freeing us from tyranny and oppression uh, and the way that we treat each other. But actually it's something even deeper and greater than that. The salvation that God has brought us is peace with God himself. That is the salvation that we need. This chapter tells us that we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've gone astray from the one who made us and the one we were made for. That is appalling for us. And it will end appallingly, we can see, if we look at the death of Jesus. But actually, the wonder of this passage, isn't it, is that it shows us that Jesus has dealt with that. That's what his death has achieved. He's brought us from being straying like sheep to being at peace with him, to knowing his friendship, to knowing his healing and hope. So that's what the salvation is. And it's really important that we're clear about that, isn't it? Uh, because the oppression that we suffer from other people is a very real factor uh, in our lives. And it would be wonderful to be free of it. But this pa passage shows us that the salvation that we most need is something even deeper than that. We need salvation from our own, the, own, the, the way that we ourselves treat our Creator. The right punishment that that deserves. And that is what Jesus has made possible by his death. And this chapter also shows us about how, how Jesus' death achieves that very clearly, doesn't it? You see, some people say that what the cross of Christ represents is God overcoming our evil. That the cross is us doing our worst to Jesus. Uh, and yet, God raising him from the dead and vindicating him. And that is partly true, isn't it? But actually... This chapter shows us that something more than that has happened as Jesus dies on the cross. Not just God winning, not just love winning and God overcoming our evil, but evil continuing to persist. No, what happens at the cross is God acting in judgment on evil, on, in punishment on it. And it's really important that we understand that, isn't it? Because one day, God is going to do that fully and finally, on every single man and woman. That is what we deserve from God. We deserve punishment, not just to be a loser before God. We deserve to be punished and destroyed by him and forsaken by him as Jesus was on the cross. These are not nice things to think about, are they? But actually this passage shows us that they are, that is right and it's fitting and it's just given the way that we treat each other. And yet if we see that, then we see very clearly, don't we, that that punishment fall, falling on 
Jesus really has liberated us in the deepest possible way. Not just that evil gets sidelined and loses out, but evil is fully and finally done away with once and for all. That's what we have to look forward to because of Jesus and what he's achieved. A new creation without any evil in it whatsoever. Everything that we've done fully made right if we trust in him. And so uh, it's really important, isn't it? And this passage helps us be really clear on, on what the centre of that salvation is that God has offered. But more than that, this, this is a poem, isn't it? It's supposed to move us about these things. As well as seeing the, 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 with the clarity of the, these truths, it's also written to move us, to see how awesome these truths are. These are truly awesome things, aren't they? The truths that we read about in this in this poem. It makes us feel the weight of the problem that our world faces. If what is here is the case, then no other problem that our world faces, global warming, natural disasters, is as serious uh, as the problem of the judgment that we're all naturally heading towards from God. But then also, no other act is so wonderful as what Jesus has done for us. What an amazing thing to give your life for people that have treated you in that way so that they can have eternal peace and healing in the face of their derision, hatred and scorn. It is a truly wonderful thing that Jesus has done for us, isn't it? We rightly celebrate heroes on the battlefield Uh, who give their lives for others. And yet Jesus gave his life in a far deeper way, suffering the eternal punishment that we deserve in the face of our derision, not in the face of our, our thanks. And if we can see that, then isn't it appropriate that we live our lives in thanksgiving and worship to him? What he has done for us and the way that he has loved us is so wonderful. It is a love that is more precious than anything that we could experience in this world. So may our lives be lived in praise to the Lord Jesus. Let's pray about these things. Let's bow our heads uh, and I'll say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we see in Jesus' death the depth of the predicament, the trouble that we are in before you, as we see him punished by you and forsaken by you. And yet we also see in his death, him taking our punishment on himself, the one who never did anything wrong, so that we can be free, so that we can know peace with you, and so that one day we can be fully and finally healed of all that troubles us, of all our sufferings and all the afflictions that we experience in this world. Father, these are truly awesome truths and we thank you so much for them. We thank you so much that for whoever turns to you that we can see this, we can know this peace and that we can know you as our Father and we can know Jesus as our Lord. So we ask that you would help us to see these things. Help us to see them clearly, we pray, more and more clearly each day. And please would our lives be lived in light of this being the greatest ever event in the history of the world. Would we live lives of praise and worship to Jesus? For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.